the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. Hello and welcome to The Best in the World with Richard Parr, where every single Wednesday I interview a different Olympic champion, world champion, world record holder or former world number one to find out what they do to become the very best in their fields. They could be cricket players, rugby players, footballers, sprinters, cyclists, rowers, you name it, we've had them on this show and there are so many more great people that we will continue to learn from on The Best in the World. This week's guest, I am delighted to say, is the Olympic champion cyclist Katie Archibald, part of the Great Britain team that won the team pursuit at the Rio 2016 Olympics. I got to speak to Katie about six weeks ago in November before the busy Christmas period and we cover a whole load of things including how she likes to relax, so things like movies and books. We talk about what she could perhaps do when she finishes being a cyclist. Maybe she could be going to university. We talk about that, what exactly she gave up at university to continue her dream of becoming a champion cyclist. We talk about how she took up the sport relatively late and in fact enjoyed swimming and was a pretty decent swimmer and we talk about the success of her family she comes from a great lineage of fantastic sports stars i really enjoyed this chat with katie it's a bit different to some of the other interviews we've had i can't really put my finger on it but i think when you listen back to it you'll you'll see what i mean really great girl really fun chat really open conversation and I think this was a refreshing chat with Katie definitely one we can all learn from so we can improve our everyday lives just before we get to the interview I want to tell you that today's show is brought to you by the sports breakfast show Sportachino it is live every single weekday morning from 8 GMT it's streamed live on Facebook YouTube and Periscope all at the same time so there's no excuse for you to miss it if you've got one of those social media channels. We discuss all different types of things from sports, health, fitness, nutrition and travel and I say we because I am the presenter of Sportachino. Come and check us out, let me know what you think. We're on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash Sportachino and it's at Sportachino on all of the other handles for Instagram, for Twitter, for Periscope and all that jazz. So check out Sportachino. They are today's sponsor. All right, let's get on with the show. Let's get on from learning from the very best in the world, the Olympic cycling champion, Katie Archibald. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Katie Archibald, Olympic gold medalist, world record holder in cycling team pursuit. Welcome to the best in the world. Now, it's been an unfortunate few couple of weeks. That's right, isn't it? You've had a bit of an injury. Yeah, no, it's it's been a bit crap to manage. It's been um, been confusing, actually, because, uh, well... Uh, well, I, I crashed on a race, basically, um, at Glasgow World Cup, which is the first, first round of the World Cup series. And uh, um, it was in a Madison race, and, and me and my partner actually went on to win the race. So, um, well, obviously, this was before I'd uh, realised that I'd broken my wrist. Did I say that? I've, yeah, I've, I'm maybe going slightly nuts, stuck inside a lot now. So, um, but, uh, but, yeah, so it was actually... Like it's the happiest that I've ever been with a broken wrist, if I'm honest. Um, and we've, I don't know, it's kind of weird to be on such a high with the the race win. Um, yeah, it kind of led to, well, so far of a fortnight of um, lows, I suppose. Uh, but yeah, it's been a case of kind of acknowledging those contradictions and and getting on with the day to day. Mm. And it's not the first time you've you've had some injuries and some crashes. They've happened before, right? Um, well, well, my line is that this is the first time I've uh, <clears throat> seriously injured myself on on my push bike. So, any time I've had a bike crash before, which has been lo- loads, I guess that's that's the sport. Um, and 
I assume what you're referring to <laughs> is, uh, yeah, I did. I crashed my motorbike last winter. So this does feel slightly reminiscent of that um, in terms of, uh, like, I started taking up walking because I wasn't allowed on the, the turbo for seven days. And that was what my rehab was last last year. I'd uh, I ruptured my posterior cruciate ligament and uh, fractured my elbow. So this is a lot better. Like, my legs my legs are okay. Um, and it's just, it's just my wrist, not my elbow. So I can... Well, actually, no, I guess it's pretty much the same. Um, but yeah, so I guess it is is—it is a bad habit. But I think, uh, I think I'm going to be ready for the, the, next, the next couple of World Cups, which but they don't come till February. So I don't, I don't see this making as big a dent as, as last time. You said about your motorcycle injury. Now, obviously, uh, I believe it was a crash at about 70 miles an hour. Now, that can probably be scary enough. But was it more scary, the thought that this could potentially affect you being at the Rio Olympics? Um, well, I didn't, to be honest, I didn't have the sense for that. I think it's a, it's a cyclist habit that, um, you kind of, you get up and you try and get back on your bike and I wasn't in a race, obviously I wasn't. Um, <laughs> and, uh, at the time I, I was preoccupied with, we had, um, again, it was a, a round of the world cup was in maybe two and a half weeks. I think it was, um, at that point. And that was my main, main occupation at the time, I guess with a link to the Olympics, because, um, I hadn't been, um, I hadn't been selected for any of the qualifying lineups in the the races that we had had a couple races just before that, um, and I knew that I was this. I guess it sounds like a stupid sob story, but I was going really well. <laughs> I knew I was going really well, and I was really looking forward to being able to uh, sort of like prove myself in a race. Um, yeah, so that was my immediate thought, and then it went to the World Championships, which were three months away, um, and well, it was in so it was in December, and the Olympics were in August, and. Well, I knew that I stood up right afterwards, so I figured I didn't. Yeah, I just didn't. I didn't have the sense to see that that, that was in jeopardy, um, and it took a lot of X-rays and MRI scans for somebody to sort of shove it in my face and say, "Listen, you like you can you can barely walk. Or you're not gonna uh, you're not gonna come jumping out of here." So um, yeah, but luckily, I guess we can ruin the, the end of the story. Like, no, that I did make it to Olympics in the end, but no, I didn't make it to that World Cup, and I didn't make it to those World Championships. So that's that's still, I guess, a, a bit of a pain for last season. Mm, well, it is, it is a happy story in the end, and we'll get into more about Rio in just a moment. You mentioned about going a little bit nuts recently. How do you normally take away that boredom? What do you normally do to try and stay relaxed? And, and when you aren't able to train, what do you like to do? Um, well, I guess the, the trick to, uh, yeah... <laughs> Avoid manic behavior, <laughs> I reckon, is routine. Um, so you've got to, I don't know, um, you've got to pretend that you do have a, a purpose outside of cycling. And uh, I guess I like to pretend that mine's writing, but um, it's another thing that kind of comes um, sporadically rather than uh, with any kind of set schedule. Um, so if anything, I guess it maybe exacerbates those uh, those swings around <laughs> emotionally. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, I know. I guess um, the the similar habits of all cyclists that you'll you'll find they they've always got a TV series on the go, or maybe maybe it's just track cyclists. I don't know. I guess roadies are uh, out sunbathing all day, aren't they? But yeah, we'll always have a TV series on the go and, and usually a good book because they're either yeah, I guess there's a lot of recommended feet up time. Not to yeah, not to brag about it. It's, um, it's not always a hard life. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your recommended book and recommended TV series then? Um, oh, well, actually, the book I'm reading at the moment, uh, I, it's not really a recommendation. I, I think I can say it in a podcast because it's a, it's a name. So it's called I Love Dick. It's taken a, like a bit of a um, – what's it's been revived, I suppose, of late as a sort of cult classic. And, oh, I'm hating it. <laughs> uh, I kinda, yeah, someone recommended it. Someone – I guess I'd respect and I really want to be able to talk about it with them, but I'm, I'm honestly, I'm forcing myself through it. It's just so pretentious. I can't, but yeah, and I can tell that I'm maybe not, maybe I'm not smart enough to, to engage with it. Maybe that's what it is. I'm not sure. Um, so yeah, so instead, well, I've got my favorite books. So um, the hundred year old man that climbed out of the window and disappeared. I always, that's always a comfort. In fact, there's a, there's a couple other Jonas, Jonasson books that, um, I guess take a similar similar theme that quite fun. Um, Catch twenty two. Um, oh, all the hitchhiker books. In fact, Douglas had like the Dark Gently series as well. Um, but um, yeah, I'm actually late to the party. I've only just started reading Harry Potter. Um, oh wow! I know. Like people, are, yeah, I always roll their eyes and go, "Well, you can't be a fan now." Like I've definitely missed the boat. 
Um, <laughs> I just, oh, I hated it when I was a kid. I don't know why. As it's hardly a rebellion, not reading Harry Potter. But uh, yeah, my teammate Joanna Russell, Joanna Russell Shan, sorry, um, is a super mega fan, and she lent me the first book on camp uh, like a few months ago. So I'm sort of whenever I'm away on a away in a journey, bring out a Harry Potter book. Oh, fantastic! And and TV series. Mm. Well, actually, another one that I hate, <laughs> but for some reason <laughs> I've watched loads of. I got into Scandal. So, um, you know, our Sky sponsor British Cycling. Yeah. So uh, we've actually, I guess it, oh, they'll take our tellies away in December. But at the moment, all the British Cycling athletes have Sky television in the house. And um, Surely with your success, they can't take away your Sky. You can't take away our Sky. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous. But yeah, yeah, they're going to. I've, I've, know, I've got some friends there. I'll, I'll have a word. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I guess, yeah, and we'll, we'll advertise it now and see, see what happens. But uh, I've started watching, well, I started watching Scandal. Have you heard of it? It's, um, it's this really weird uh, American drama um, around around the White House, sort of, sort of political drama, um, in which somehow the Republicans are the good guys. Um, and it's just, I don't know, it's just like really powerful dialogue after really, like there's no real moments. And I spend the whole time just screaming at the television going, this, like, this isn't real life. And uh, <laughs> for some reason I've made it through about, I think four seasons. So um, don't watch that. I don't recommend that. I, I find that with anything with Aaron Sorkin, where it's it's just lots of lots of fast speaking dialogue, and they, they did one um, called the Newsroom around a TV newsroom, and I've obviously worked in a TV newsroom, and I was like, no one talks like this. We speak a lot oh. more simply. We don't <laughs> speak anywhere near as fast as this. Uh, so. Oh, actually, do you know what breaks my heart? Um, actually, I re- well, I really like it. Well, I love Cat Moran and um, her TV show Raised by Wolves, I think is so guilty of that. Like I kind of like I, I like it because I guess I like them. But um, yeah, every every sentence is a punchline. You can tell that if it's been written down in a script, you would have been sort of rolling over laughing. But when it comes out, I don't know, mm. when it comes out on screen, it is really sort of jilted, I think. Um but yeah, still hilarious. But you can just tell—I don't know—it's like you can see the act, which is maybe maybe being a bit fussy and um, <laughs> insisting that everything's got to seem real. But and this is all the things you normally do in your downtime. But what about building up to a big race? Is there any kind of music you read? Are there any passages of any books or any poems? Or is there anything you, you kind of do to to help g yourself up or to concentrate on the task coming up? Yeah, I guess like on. On actual race day, um, I, I usually always listen to a, a podcast to try and get me to sleep, actually, which is why it's really bad. That I'd, I'd never actually, um, I'd never listened to any of yours, so I will, I'll, I'll add it to the list, but I guess you'll be insulted in a second because why well, listen to them to try to get me to fall asleep? Well, so you exactly. Need something the, the, this, um, this will <laughs> yeah. keep you awake. This should be what you start your day <laughs> yeah, with, Katie. You'd be like, I want to start the day by learning about the best in the world. This is how I'm going to start it with my breakfast. That's what you yeah. need to do. No, it, <laughs> It is stupid. It's the kind of thing that, um, honestly, about three years ago, I'd be obsessed with any anything that I could, uh, like any race I'd watch or any interview with, say, like Laura or, or Danny King or whatever. I'd, I'd want to know exactly what they're doing in a really kind of creepy, obsessive way. But now that I'm actually part of that world, it's it's kind of a shame to have lost that um, lost that hobby, I suppose, because I, I end up getting stressed if I read about other cyclists and I end up um, getting confused if I listen to other, like uh, if you consume, sort of surround yourself with too much to do with um i guess the elite sporting world it yeah it really stresses me out so I, yeah a shame that i've lost that part of my life since it's become a career um but uh it does um yeah i guess okay i might i might get back into it we'll see we'll see <laughs> um but you yeah, know on on race days and things it is because it's that panic it's when you're lying in bed that you're stress and thinking um like oh is it gonna go this way is it gonna go that way like what what are my legs gonna feel like um how am I, yeah, what if I just never fall asleep and I feel like this for the next 12 hours and well, how's the race going to go then? So you need something that's stimulating enough that you are actually paying it attention, but not so much that you can fall asleep to it. That's it. Yeah. The perfect middle ground. Um, yeah. And, and, and actually, well, I guess I'd end up going insulting lots of my favorite podcasts if I said that that's what I use them for. So <laughs> I won't, <laughs> I won't do that. <laughs> 
no, no, no point uh, upsetting anyone on, on, on today's <laughs> show. <laughs> um, so tell us a bit more about your actual uh, race day routine. Like what, what kind of things would you normally, do you have any superstitions? Would you put any socks on first, like left foot, right foot? Is there anything in particular you do or say or act on, on uh, a race no. day? Yeah, no, I'm the ultimate. Uh, is there a, a is there a, like a, an opposite of super, super? I don't know. Laura is madly like that. Like the whole, we'll stand on a wet towel. Or, um, lucky number is number seven, and so she she needs a a number to some way have some calculation to be linked to the number seven. Um, like we'll follow lots of little routines. She's got her. Uh, She's got a stupid amount of lucky mascots in her bag, actually, <laughs> because um, I think she'll get given one and think, like, if, if it ends up with her on a certain race day that goes well, well, that's it. That that cuddly toy is now stuck. It's going to have to come <laughs> with us forever. Um, so I don't know why. I must be a horrible person, but I feel like my role is to be the opposite of that. So, um, <laughs> no, you can't. Not allowed to get, uh, not allowed to get hooked on any superstitions. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. More from Katie in just a moment, but I want to tell you that today's show is also brought to you by Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. It's a product I personally use. I love listening to audiobooks, whether I'm on public transport, whether I'm in the gym, whether I'm going for a run. I love listening and learning on audiobooks. They've got over 180,000 titles to choose from. Most recently, I listened to The Alchemist by Paolo Coelho. Interesting book, quite short, about four hours. I was able to speed through it. And what's great about Audible is you can actually speed up the pace of the listen. So, for example, it was Jeremy Irons was the voiceover for it. But I put him at at one and a half speed and I was able to listen to a four-hour audiobook in three hours. Look at that. I'm cramming in the learning. What a smart idea that is. And you can do the same because Audible are offering a free 30-day trial and that includes one free download. All you've got to do is go to this website address. Get your pens and paper at the ready. It's audibletrial.com forward slash best. All right, get the notes page on your mobile phone because that's what most of us do. It's audibletrial.com forward slash best. That is today's sponsor. Please go and check them out. Over 180,000 titles to choose from. Really great learning at your fingertips. Speaking about great learning, we will continue to do that next with Katie Archibald. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. And you, you said you used to listen to kind of lots of podcasts and interviews and things where you would look up to to other athletes. What kind of things did you you think you really learned from them? Were really able to bring in into your success? Oh, that's interesting, actually. Yeah, um, like has it actually been useful that mm. that obsession? Um, I think uh, when I was when I was starting to get good, I guess my main um, my main interest was the uh, the top Scottish riders. So because I'd I'd kind of I'd see them around, like I'd realise that they were uh, almost at this accessible point, just because you know they came from the same place you came from. So people like Eileen Rowe, Charlene Joyner, um, Kaylee Brogan, who, who doesn't actually ride anymore, but um, they'd, uh, I guess, they'd have a good laugh. And I think it was that that communication that they were always, uh, I knew that they were always talking to each other, I knew that they were always kind of um, taking tips off each other. And I think that's that important, the, um, the fact that you've got to make these relationships to benefit everybody. So... Um, you can be sat in your garage training on a turbo thinking that you're putting in a lot of work, but if you've not, I don't know, got the smarts to see that it's a good idea to put some gym work in, or maybe somebody tells you like, oh, you're looking a bit tired, maybe just step off a bit, or um, just like having these uh, encounters that open your eyes to to new things about your training, about your racing, to, uh, about all sorts of um, technique and, and protocols that you're just, you're not going to learn obsessing yourself on the internet I don't think um like it, it does take being at your local club and um having these conversations so yeah I think that's and I guess the and the natural way that you get there is just by having a good time it is by having having friends in the cycling world and I almost 
I guess, envied their, uh, yeah, their, their social group of elite women cycling. So, I th- yeah, I think that counts as a useful thing to have learned. Mm, yeah, definitely. So who are some of the people who, who've helped you the most, would you say? Um, well, the thing that keeps me up at night and terrifies me about how much help they've given me is um, a chap called Alistair Watson who runs uh, runs the racers. Um, they're an Edinburgh-based club, so they used to be called the Edinburgh Racers. And uh, they've um, basically, I turned up to the Meadowbank track one day and uh, Alistair lent me a bike, shoved me up there. In hindsight, I suppose probably an, yeah, outrageously dangerous actually, but um, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and said, literally after I think I maybe came back again a, a few times and uh, he wasn't, he didn't sort of push me to say like, do you want to be good at this? Like, is this something you're committed to? He's just like, are you having a good time? And I say, yeah, yeah I'm having a good time. And um, he sort of makes out now that he, he always knew there was something, there was something good going on, but I'm not sure, <laughs> you can never tell how true that is. But honestly, the amount of uh, time and equipment and um, advice that he gave me honestly, for maybe the first two years of my career were all just, um, well, it wasn't until I got in the British cycling program that I gave Alistair back his track back. I'd been using it. So in, until I got to a point where I'd uh, received lottery funding and could go full time as a cyclist and all that time, I'd still been using his using his training rings and his sprockets, which I guess I'm embarrassed for. Me. But, uh, <laughs> honestly, the, yeah, ev- everything that I learned about trying to get into being a, a track racer <clears throat> for those first couple of seasons, um, they did come from, from Alistair and his, his son Callum. So, yeah, that, yeah, it scares me that um, I guess I'm certainly not contributing back to the cycling community in that way. Um, I guess it's it's a time in your life, maybe, that once you, I guess, yeah, once I'm not training myself, I'd certainly love to be to be able to do for somebody what Alistair did for me. Yeah, and I'm sure there's lots of time for you to do that because you're, you're still young. And, and we could talk a little bit more about what you might want to do after cycling a little bit later. But you, you actually took the sport up comparatively late, in uh, I believe in, in 2011 when, when you, you took it up competitively. Were you, mm-hmm. was it, did it just come natural to you? Was you just really good really quickly? And, and, and if so, where do you think you had that? the skill set from was there anything else you did earlier in your life which you think helped I almost get kind of down about this because I've actually I've seen interviews before where even my teammates will be like yeah and she only took it up like 18 months ago I've even heard somebody say like yeah she only rode a bike for the first time like age 16 or something which is just mad <laughs> like, hmm. like I've been oh I've been I've been cycling all my life but I was uh, when I was a, a kid I was a swimmer and I guess anyone that swam knows that that just consumes everything that you do like you used to keep this list of uh chronologically you could see all the other sports I would slowly slowly quit as swimming training just ramped up and up and up like yeah I used to go to gymnastics and ballet and and trampoline and and hockey is actually the only one that that stayed throughout that and I just used my bike eventually for getting from A to B whether it's like cycling to swimming training or cycling to hockey training um but no even like like we went on our first touring holiday technically when I was seven years old it's been like it's it's been a a family pursuit since well, since I could ride a bike, and I guess that means that it's been hideously competitive <laughs> since I could ride a bike um, uh, with my sort of my big brother and my dad. Uh, so I, I'd like to think that I guess in the same way that like if somebody did a running race for the first time um, age 16, I guess it's less tactical. And so <clears throat> oh, I'm going to get loads of abuse now. Eh? But I think it's less tactical than a bike race. That is my belief, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, but nobody would question. So because of that, everyone would be like, oh, well, I guess if you've been training as a runner your whole life, then sure, we'd expect you to, to be all right. Um, and what I came through with in 2012 at Junior Nationals was a pursuit. And uh, that's just the case of going hard um, at the, well, for juniors, it's, it's two kilometers. So yeah, I was I was the best at, at that time um, in this two kilometer pursuit. And I got a silver medal in the points race, which I rode like an idiot, like a I was I was off the front for the whole race, basically not interacting with the the bunch at all. So I I guess I did have a a lot of learning to be doing um in in those early years because I guess I trained the engine and and not my head, but because of that I think I had a bit of a a chip on my shoulder, I suppose, or a lot of paranoia that I, I wanted to be technically excellent. I wanted to be smart, um, and I wanted to show that I like I could be an enticing, um, exciting bike racer. And so I think 
yeah, I guess I, I put a lot of hard work into that as a project, um, which has maybe been a benefit that I could do that age 16 rather than um, age 12 or 11. If, I don't know if people end up getting into bad habits. That's probably not true. They've probably just got a sixth sense for it that I don't know, maybe I'll never have. But um, yeah, I like to think that I'm now, now in a position where I've given up on saying, oh, and you, you've you've come to it relatively early, uh, sorry, relatively late. So, um, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm ditching the tag is what I'm doing. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But your your whole family are, are all pretty talented athletes, aren't they? Oh, it's funny, actually. Yeah, so I've been living in Manchester the last three years and just moved back to Glasgow. And I was at track league a few weeks ago. Um, and I was still John Archibald's little sister because um, <laughs> he's now like the, the big name of the Scottish cycling Scottish cycling scene he doesn't actually ride the track which is what we're all trying to convince him to do um but yeah I think he's a fairly formidable force up here with the road racing um and my yeah my sister uh, well she's my half sister so Rosie Smith is a uh, sort of top top cross-country runner um I've actually met I've again met people before that have been like no way you're Rosie's sister because well I can describe me actually so at the moment I'm I'm quite sweaty. I'm still in my shorts. Um, I'd say I'm I'm not chunky, but there's there's like, no, I'm chunky. I'm quite chunky, but it's a powerful chunky. And my sister is uh, just one of those runners where it's not that she's really muscular. She's just all bone. Like I don't know how she moves. I, like I th- she just floats. There's nothing. <laughs> there's nothing holding her onto the ground. Like I can't see any muscle. I can't see any fat. She's just all bone. <laughs> so yeah, we're quite <laughs> we're quite a contrast. <laughs> um and yeah it's been it's been remarked on before and I've not taken it very well if I'm honest (laughs) but um yeah my my dad uh my dad was a runner and um my mother was the supplier of mitochondria so she feels very proud as well wow yeah incredible talent there so let's talk about Rio your first Olympic Games is that right Mm mm-hmm how apart from actually the huge success which we'll get on to how was just the experience of being there to begin with Oh, is that, oh, it's, it was daunting from the first moment that we stepped in the village because um, I'd been to the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow and uh, well, just sort of driven the 20 minutes down the road to get there kind of thing, not a, not a massive long haul flight. And um, it was just so big. You would not believe how many athletes compete in an Olympic Games. It, it was, well, I guess obviously it's, it's a little village, but it was. It was a, a fairly major village, I would have said. Yeah, I could have. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess I found that kind of, um, I guess, yeah, you end up reflecting the fact that you've been obsessing over your own performance and um, getting yourself in, in peak condition and just assuming that this is the biggest thing in the world because, uh, well, it was. That was um, everything that consumed my sort of day-to-day life for the last the last two years and uh, suddenly realised that there's actually a thousand other people um, doing the exact same thing <laughs> when you've kind of, I don't know, you get uh, almost a bit self-obsessed, I suppose. Um, so yeah, so that that was interesting to to realise. But other than that, um, well, our, our competition was right in the middle of the game, so we got to kind of experience the build-up and the excitement as Team GB people were winning medals, but still had quite a lot of time to celebrate afterwards. Like I stayed all the way to the closing ceremony, um, so I had ten days in Rio of just. Uh, being a, a mega fan, I think, a bit of a tourist. Mm-hmm. So that was quite cool. What did you get to see? Um, oh, well, we did all the classics. So climbed up to Christ the Redeemer and uh, got to see his big toe and a little bit of his ankle because it was quite cloudy. <laughs> um, it was very cloudy, actually. Oh, I'm so glad we walked. It was it was so busy. Like, considering that you you honestly couldn't see the guy, like the wind would occasionally blow and maybe you'd, you'd see a little bit. But, um, but yeah, and I did all uh, Christ the Redeemer, Sugarloaf, um sort of eaten from food carts and whatnot and uh i guess with the um i've just realized 10 minutes into that rant that you mean what races did i get to see because that's what a sports person would be interested in i'm i'm that. i'm enjoy- i'm enjoying <laughs> your your holiday postcards right now it's fine i've never <laughs> been i wanted to go I, I couldn't make it but i'm now imagining myself there at sugarloaf so it's it's all yeah. good to con- con- continue with your with your photo oh, so, yeah. please <laughs> No, no, I did. I did get to see some. Um, actually, the best thing I got to see was uh, me and my teammate Eleanor Barker. We got tickets for the final of the men's beach volleyball, which was Brazil versus Italy. So we're in this massive stadium packed with a load of Brazilians, 
just like a, and it's it's it's, well, it's the first time I'd been to see beach volleyball, and it's a party. Like they've got they've got different dance moves for um, different points. One, um, and uh, like you all sing along, and it's it was no, it was insane. It was like no sporting event that I've ever been to. Um, oh, actually, I guess a bit like London Six Day. That was a a new party experience for me as well. But um, the uh, the crowd were, I guess, as the press let on. Um, but yeah, super pro Brazilian. But uh, because we weren't Brazilian, I felt like just somebody had to support the Italians. But I just didn't <laughs> want to get lynched. Like, <laughs> honestly, it was so tense. <laughs> I've never seen. It's just to see a crowd flip from such high emotion to such anger. If the if the yeah if the Italians had the the goal to score a point, it was yeah it was it was really weird. Really yeah, weird. we we had the um, Olympic champion Phil Dalhauser. He's the the current episode of the Best in the World going out now. He he won it in two thousand eight. And he competed at the 2016 Games and he lost in one of the earlier rounds to the eventual Brazilian winners. And he said the whole time he was being booed. And he said, it's fine. Mm-hmm. It's actually quite good at the atmosphere. And, you know, it's because the Brazilians think that they invented volleyball. The Americans think <laughs> they invented volleyball. You know, obviously you were facing Americans and Australians and all, all, all kind of more traditional cycling nations. Now, mm. what would have happened, do you think, if you were facing a Brazilian team? And would you be able to cope with the booze? Would you have been able to cope with some kind of atmosphere like you got in the volleyball arena? Yeah, no, it's weird. Because um, I've never... Uh, yeah, I've never experienced anything like that. Like, uh, I guess uh, a French crowd is quite patriotic. Quite patriotic. They definitely... Um, but it's, it, yeah, nothing near as severe. Um. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, I'd I'd like to think that it would be like any other kind of race nerves that once you hear the gun go and you sort of the winds rushing past your ears, you just be sort of consumed in the the moment of effort rather than thinking about what's going on around you. But um, yeah, the best distraction we ever had was London World Cup. So home crowd, big home support, and the the beeps are going down. Say like ten seconds ago, five seconds ago, and somebody shouts from the crowd like really close to us, Laura Trot's well fit. <laughs> and, uh, it was that kind of way where I guess like you were like you really want to give it a moment I don't know like either to laugh or, and no I just had like just had to ignore it <laughs> just like head down <laughs> kind of thing um so yeah I may would it be I guess it probably wouldn't be the same reaction to uh to negative negative applause but um I got yeah had a had a bit of bit of practice in zoning out yeah, and do, when you do have such a partisan crowd supporting you, does it help in any way, or do you really just lock it off, whether it is negative or positive? Yeah, you're right. Actually, yeah, I've never um, never heard it described as partisan, but I suppose that is. Um, yeah, uh, no, I don't. I just wouldn't say lock it out. I quite like what, when we walk up to the the starting gate. Um, I don't know, being able to yeah keep your back straight, your your head high, and uh, acknowledge that I guess you're, you're here to put a show on um it's it's hard on a bunch race because uh for a, a timed event there's a a buzzer that goes down a countdown that goes down whereas in a bunch race you'll be holding on to the the fence at, at the side of the track um waiting for the the starter to decide that the race is ready and it'll blow his whistle for you to all push away but um Honestly, my, my hand will be shaking holding on to the side of it because you well you don't really know like it could be five minutes it could it could be ten seconds it's I guess I'm exaggerating maybe but um, it feels like that <laughs> that you just sort of sat in suspense thinking are, are, we, are we going are we, are we ready and um, yeah my stomach's definitely doing somersaults for that whereas there's I guess it's far more controllable a timed event and uh, that's what I guess that's what British cycling love we love protocol and practice and yeah focusing on the process that's that's our mantra mm, and let's talk about the day that you became an olympic gold medalist you broke the world record just tell us about that day how your feelings were did you do anything differently and just y- y- your sheer emotions at the end of it all to be honest the most um uh, the sort of the biggest thing that i hold on to i suppose emotion wise uh, wasn't actually when we finished the race so it's more um whilst we were riding and having a, I guess you get these rare moments that you, you kind of tap into an effort that only comes once in a while. Um, I, I don't think it's like, I think I've spoken to other people that 
I guess express it similarly, but almost this this moment of transcendence when um, you're not aware of the fact that you're in agony and there's a almost a disconnect between your your head and your legs and you just know that it's working you know like a uh, effortless is the wrong word because obviously it's um well yeah it's the, the extreme end of effort um but yeah it's it's this nice moment I can honestly I can pinpoint the first time that I felt this way of I think I was about um maybe 13 years old in a in a swimming race and it's yeah it's like floating um being at this yeah this point of perfect physical physical performance really um and I think well conveniently I think that's the the most extreme that I felt that in in an Olympic final so um yeah cho- chose the right moment um, mm. and uh yeah I guess to have gone faster than than any women's team has ever gone before I yeah I'm really kind of pleased and proud that we came away with that as well as the Olympic medal um just to kind of after the the last few world championship seasons that we've had of um, a bronze and a silver um kind of nice to be able to prove that we're not just on top on that day like we've we're on top for yeah all that's ever been at the moment <laughs> um, so yeah I guess uh I'm, I'm, I'm over dramatizing now aren't I <laughs> but <laughs> it does yeah it does um sort of stick in my memory I suppose that that moment of crossing the finish line and uh, I guess that's when everything came crashing back in when you kind of realized it was it was all over and a new thing was beginning really this um yeah this new Olympic champion uh not pressure but experience yeah which has been quite bizarre that I can draw a line in the sand of saying uh I sort of saw myself one way before the race and you end up so yeah, I almost see yourself a different way afterwards. It's it's weird how how much one competition can uh, yeah affect um kind of what you expect of yourself. I think. Okay, so w- what what did you see yourself as before? What do you see yourself now as? Um. Well, I guess before yeah before it's just aspirational bike rider. Like we, well, <laughs> as you say, been been world champion and, and we had been world record holders in the past. Um, <clears throat> but I knew that there was a uh, well in a team with previous Olympic champions and um, always uh, kind of riding on the the wider team success and I guess there were so many Olympians around that um, there's always somebody to look up to and so because I'd felt that way about them knowing that uh, sorry the London Olympians or the Beijing Olympians because I'd felt that way about them um, when I myself be, became an Olympic champion um, oh I decided that there must be a uh, there must now be people that feel that way about me. And I don't, I don't think there are, but it just means that, um, so if I, uh, like I turned up to a training session late, um, one of my first British sessions back and, um, uh, what else? And, and I got one of the efforts wrong and I made some other kind of cock up and I just kept thinking in my head, like you meant to be Olympic champion, like Olympic champion doesn't do this, mm. <laughs> you know? And like, I guess it's, I can, I can acknowledge it's stupid because like, I'm still just, obviously still just the same person, but I guess, um, I just got really aggravated thinking like, yeah, you, you, like you're meant to be this, uh, this great athlete. Like you're meant to <clears throat> be a mold of, uh, I guess you get classic situations when you're a kid of being in training situations and say, you'll see, uh, I don't know, like people will talk about Chris Oy changes his own weights at the gym. He, he won't have the gym coach following after him, like picking up the, like unstacking the leg press and all that. Um, and it'll become an Olympic champion trait. They'll be like, oh yeah, look at that. That's, that's how an Olympic champion acts kind of thing. Um, and it's ridiculous because there's no, <laughs> there's no set guidebook for, um, this is how Olympic champion acts. But I guess I ended up just at the moment, anytime I, yeah, as I say, anytime I have a cock up, I was saying, oh, for, like, bloody hell, <laughs> that's not what Olympic champions do. Mm. And yeah, I guess worried that I'm going to get caught out. So I'm going to take the medal off me. <laughs> But yeah, I'm still still undercover. Nobody knows yet. But I guess it all goes down to routine as well, doesn't it? Like you you know what the right routine is because you've proved it to be successful by winning gold. Do you feel also part of it is not necessarily the it's you're upset with yourself, but you feel now that because you are a champion, people are looking up to you, and that they're kind of going, oh look. Katie's doing this we we expect her to be hitting this standard all the time is that part of it um yeah yeah to be honest but I can again like 
I feel that way, but I, I don't know that you'd actually find anybody that says it, you know? Like, I feel like I've maybe just created it in my head, <laughs> this, this imaginary pressure. The only person that says it isn't... So my first race back, um, I'd had a month off the bike, and then I had a week back training, and on the Saturday, um, I had a race that was Manchester Revolution. And I thought, you know what, it's just it's a good way to train, just get into the race, and you'll have to be tactical rather than strong, like, just give it a go kind of thing. Um, and I did all right. And I came back the next the next day, and uh, my dad goes, "Oh, isn't it embarrassing that everyone thinks that so and so is better than you?" And um, watched. I guess there's no point in hiding it. So uh, Danny Khan had won the uh, elimination scratch race, and he goes, "Yeah, isn't it embarrassing? You know, because like everyone will think that maybe Danny Khan should have been at the Olympics, or like kind of thing." And I was like, "Dad, no, like you're the only one that's thinking this, and maybe he's not." <laughs> but it's just annoying that that, that person's at home telling me, <laughs> um, you know, like saying. <laughs> Oh, aren't you? Aren't you very ashamed that you're not winning everything? Um, and I think I'm almost glad, glad to have had some losses or to have um, had that loss anyway. Um, because, well, it's horrible to have so much pressure that you don't turn up to race because, all, like, you're only allowed to win. Um, like, I think Laura gets stuck in that situation sometimes because Laura Trot wins everything. If she, if she's third or if she's seventh or whatever, it's, um, it's not the person that won the race that gets remarked upon it's the fact that Laura that Laura didn't win the race that gets remarked upon um and I guess yeah I'd, I don't envy her that situation um I think it's yeah it's almost uh sort of healthy for your head if you can if you can throw in the odd loss mm-hmm. <laughs> uh which I guess because that's that's how training works like you've you've got to be suppressed and sometimes you still need the race experience um but focus on the fact that um like your taper comes up uh in in a month's time or it comes up for for nationals or um for a world cup or whatever and i guess that i'm saying this because like it it worked out for me so far and that i did come around for europeans and i did come around for glasgow world cup and obviously now it's going backwards but um yeah it's it's turning up to the the lesser races getting a kicking and i guess accepting it after becoming an Olympic champion, where, where what is the motivation? Like, is it the fact that you've got one gold, you want more? Is it the fact that you've now set these levels and you, you a bit like you were saying about Laura there, that you want to keep hitting that standard of being, I am the standard bearer, I want to keep winning golds, I want to be that level. Is it that you want to reach that, you know, almost moment of transcendence, you said? It, like, is it that addiction of being in that position once again? Um, or is it just the sheer love of cycling? Like, where where does the motivation come from now, and, and what are the goals as well? I guess for me, so um, <clears throat> uh, so at the Olympics in a team event, so it's a team of four of us, um, and uh, I put everything in my training in, into that one event. So I've not been training for bunch racing. I've not been training for individual pursuiting. Um, everything's been about team pursuit. So it it's almost. Um, the success has almost opened a door for me that I can now a bit have a bit of freedom, freedom um, to to be racing omniums, to be doing individual pursuits, to be turning up to um, to things like the six days and and uh, yeah, just do a lot more racing. Like the the Olympics was my second race of 2016, and in August, so because I had that injury, um, and then because we end up not wrapped in cotton wool, but just really focused on on the Olympics, um, I, I missed basically a whole whole season of racing um, so uh i guess it's quite lucky that i've i've got that craving um to have almost what i see as a, a new motivation to kind of get my teeth stuck into this season um obviously still still track cycling um but i've actually i guess taken a step away from team pursuit and what we're doing at the olympics uh so i guess for for another athlete um that what they do at the olympics is uh so like I guess I don't know the guy, but maybe Greg Rutherford. Um, so you go and have a successful Olympic Games. Um, it's probably not like he can then be like, oh, well, I'll just focus on high jump this season because he's a long jumper, isn't he? As I guess the benefit um, benefit for us is that I'm a team pursuer, but I can say, oh, I'll just I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on Madison this season. And um, yeah, I guess that that makes everything just a whole lot easier. And even in the summer, I can say, I'm, well, I'm going to be doing a lot more road racing. Like, um, oh, just cycling's just the best. Just we get to do everything. I tell you, <laughs> <laughs> specifically track cycling, because <laughs> uh, well, I end up, I end up in the gym or on the turbo and on the track and out on the road, and there's just all all sorts to to be getting up to. So, yeah, I guess I I love my sport, and that's that's what motivates me. 
Mm. And have you ever thought about what might happen after cycling? I know you, you said about maybe giving back and doing some coaching. Have you thought about anything else other than cycling or do you think you'll always be with the sport? Mm. It's the kind of thing that you swing in and out of. So I love the idea of coaching. Though. I love the idea of obsessing over a, over a program and having like this really dedicated protege that's going to, uh, <laughs> that's going to listen to my every word. Um, but then other days you think, I just want out of this world. Like I can't, I can't deal with the stress. I can't deal with the, the relationships. I just like, I'm getting out as soon as I can kind of thing. And those, those are sort of few and far between. Um, but I guess, it, yeah, it would be sensible to, uh, to make plans if I get kicked off tomorrow. Um, so that's a kicked off the, the British program tomorrow. Um, but I, I haven't. Um, <laughs> I don't know whether I'd maybe uh, ever think about going to university because uh, I well, I um, gave up my place at uni uh, to to go full time instead. So I feel a bit self conscious about it sometimes. Really, like um, maybe, maybe can't hold your own in conversations. That I guess you're just missing this experience that um, all my friends seem to have, and I guess this way of learning or this higher education that. I don't know. I'm going to get uh, caught out for it at some point. Um, well, I, <laughs> so, uh, I've, I've got a degree and I, I can't get into many conversations, so don't worry about that. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, what would you have studied had you taken your place? Ah, uh, see, this is why I should never say. Um, I was meant to be studying French, and I hate to admit it because uh, people assume that you can speak French, and I guess there would have been a point in time where I could have held up a shaky conversation, um, but. I'm now back to, so that was um, four years ago. So I'm now back to tourist mode of can order a coffee and all that stuff. But um, yeah, it would take a lot of work to get me back up to uh, any kind of university entry level, <laughs> I'm afraid. Do you think it would be French you would do if you did decide to go to university or would you pick something else? Mm, no, no way. Well, what I wanted to do, um, I wanted to apply for um, English literature and philosophy as a, as a, a joint honours, but I decided that I wasn't, sort of a great enough mind um to, to sort of make it an acad- as an academic um and I guess if you're not going to do that then it's what's well, obviously not a vocational degree is it so I I uh I guess I like languages so that's how it ended up thinking if I study French then there's yeah there's lots of um doors that that could open um I was I'd done a I'd done higher Spanish as a, a crash course for a year um and that one I hate to admit because because it all went in in a year oh god it all went out in like a month <laughs> um I'm pretty good at sort of yeah cramming for exams I'm one of those yeah I'm one of those arseholes that um, <laughs> that isn't isn't smart at all and then still still gets bloody A's and you just want to kick them in the teeth um but well, um you, you say you say that uh, though but do you not think there are some of the transferable skills because look you've reached the top level in sport you've become an Olympic gold medalist you know about routine you know about organization you know about where to improve and how to improve surely you must be able to take those skills into a more academic field uh, for me I, I wouldn't see any reason why you couldn't do that does that make sense yeah yeah I guess yeah yeah hopefully yeah um and I guess the uh well I guess the pain is that if um if I did want to do a degree I definitely see it being um arts not science uh whereas I'm I'm pretty sure, like at the moment, I think all of our coaches do actually have degrees, like even though they're ex-riders, um, like Paul Manning's got a degree in geology, I think. I think Chris Newton's sports, uh, maybe sports science, actually. But um, yeah, I don't, but I, like it, they never make out like it's a, like it is a prerequisite to become a coach. I think they're all sort of employed on the basis of being, um, yeah, being Olympic champions themselves and, and kind of having that lodge. But um yeah, I guess maybe maybe one day, <laughs> maybe one day I got a bit more confidence in, in sort of uh, in my head rather than my legs. We'll see. Yeah, well, we'll have to see. Well, we look forward to following your journey, Katie. It's been so interesting to talk to you today. If we want to continue to learn from you and see what you're up to and everything like that, how can we do that on social media, please? Uh, right, okay. Um, I'm on Twitter. It's uh, underscore Katie Archibald. Um, oh, I just set up a Facebook page. Oh, this is brilliant timing because um, it's like it's just my family that's liked it so far. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'm just Katie Archibald, um, and I think the Facebook's facebook.com slash Katie Archibald Cyclist. Um, I also run a blog, but I've not updated it in a while. But there's a lot of stuff on there anyway, and it's called um, what's well, blogspot dot 
bikes and bobs oh no sorry bikes and bobs dot blogspot you can tell that i've never advertised it people just find it <laughs> I, um. <laughs> I, I i found it i didn't get enough time to oh, read yeah? it but uh the um the main headline is is certainly got my attention oh good okay good um, there we go worth uh, a read <laughs> yeah yeah i think it says in fact i might have it right here um where is it uh there we go if you read all the way to the bottom you get to read the word vagina incentive yeah that's the most recent article have a have a browse some top tips in there um <laughs> but otherwise it's not usually uh super useful for cycling um but yeah if you're if you're interested i'm sure we will be well it's been really interesting to talk to you today really appreciate your time katie archibald thank you for being on the show and thank you for being the best in the world oh thanks for having me the Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Great stuff there from Katie. Really enjoyed that interview. If you are a cycling fan, this wasn't our first ever cycling interview. That was actually all the way back at episode four. Andy Tennant was on the show Really good chat with him. Go back and listen to that. And maybe you want to go back and listen to some of our other amazing world and Olympic champions that I've had the pleasure of interviewing. Maybe you want to listen to my interview with Darren Campbell, perhaps. Maybe you want to listen to the one with the hockey champion, Maddie Hinch. Maybe you want to listen to my interview with Chester Williams, the rugby star. So many fantastic interviews, all on the best in the world. This is episode 48, so there's 47 previous shows go back and listen to them if you've got any feedback you'd like to give me you can always send me a message on twitter it's at richard underscore par we're also on facebook which is best in the world with richard par and all of the back catalog is also available for you at richardpar.net And if you've been listening to this on iTunes, I've got a request for you. Please give us a rating and review. That would really matter a lot to us. It would help grow our show in many, many different ways. would really appreciate that. I've got another amazing guest for you next week on The Best in the World with Richard Parr. We come out every Wednesday on iTunes and on Stitcher. It's going to be another cracking episode. It'll be episode 49 where we will be learning more from the very best in sports. Until then, have a great week. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr.